Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Brookings. I'm uh, Martin Indick, the Executive uh, Vice President of Brookings. And uh, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to host uh, and introduce to you today uh, Jin Li Trin, uh, who I think is uh, known to all of you as the President-designate of the Chinese Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, this is a Chinese initiative one would say probably the most consequential diplomatic initiative in recent years, the launching of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or AIIB, as it's known. Nearly 60 countries have now joined the bank, uh, which is the clearest indication that one could have that the institution is going to play a very important uh, complementary role to the existing international financial institutions. Uh, as the architects of the bank construct its foundation uh, with intense scrutiny from around the world, uh, it will be very interesting, of great interest, to watch how the bank uh, will establish its rules for proceeding and, and how it will distinguish itself from its Bretton Woods counterparts. There is, I think, something like a $30 trillion requirement for infrastructure investment uh, around the world. And a large part of that, of course, will be in Asia. And so the AIIB has, I think, a, a critical role to play. Uh, in that context, we are particularly delighted to have the opportunity to hear from uh, its president designate, uh, Jin Li Trin. Uh, the Ch John L. Thornton China Center is sponsoring this event. And as uh, Mr. Chin has uh, noted to me uh, as we came in, he's been here before and spoken on, uh, on behalf of the Thornton China Center. So it's a delight, sir, to have you back again. Uh, we had to... Uh, cut off registration for this event. There were over 300 people that wanted to come and hear you today. Uh, we will be uh, webcasting, and of course, your remarks will be uh, available to a much uh, wider audience. Uh, but it's no surprise, because uh, Mr. Jin is uh, known uh, not just for his new job, but for uh, all of the jobs that he's done uh, before then, uh, most recently as chairman of the China International Capital Corporation, one of the world's largest investment banks. Prior to that, as chairman of the supervisory board of the China Investment Corporation, one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds, uh, and as ranking vice president of the Asian Development Bank, where he managed over 60% of the bank's portfolio. And finally, as China's vice Minister of Finance, a position that capped off two decades of distinguished service in China's public sector. Uh, he has a long and distinguished record, not just of public service, but of involvement in uh, international financial affairs. And so, therefore, it's a great honour for us today to host you, sir, and we look forward to your remarks. Following his remarks, uh, David Dollar, senior fellow, in the uh, China Center will conduct a conversation with uh, Mr. Jin. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium, Jin Li Tren. Thank you, Martin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really my great privilege and honor to meet you today. And I will say briefly, give you some information about uh, the conceptualization of AIB and what we've been achieved, what we have achieved, and what we're working to do. And then I would like to give you more time for Q&A. The idea to create a new type development bank, which turned out to be called Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, is very straightforward. That is to promote 
broad-based economic and social development through infrastructure investment in Asia. As Asia is awash in liquidity, but terribly poor in its ability recycling its huge amount of savings, at least so far as developing Asia is concerned. Asian market, either the goods market or the assets market, has remained fragmented, partly due to the connectivity problems, which certainly is due to the inefficient infrastructure. This has led to the persistent poverty, high fertility rate in expectation of old age security, low level education and environmental degradation due to the poorest desperate efforts to wrestle a meager living from the, from the fragile environment. Both the World Bank Group and ADB have contributed substantially to Asia's poverty reduction over the decades. But poverty reduction is hard to achieve, not just because of lack of funding, but more importantly, because of the approach. I have a deep conviction that poverty reduction program in and of itself will not go very far in making a difference in the livelihood of the poor and the needy. In most of the cases, the approach needs to be refined, needs to be improved. Suppose there is a community in a remote mountainous area, cut out from the outside world, dependent on arms and charity from the government and international donors. The poor areas may be actually very rich in its natural endowment in natural resources. But locals have no way tapping the natural endowments. The only solution, in my view, is connectivity. The ensuing economic opportunities will bridge the gap between the livelihood of the people and the outside world. It is as simple as all that. China's idea comes from its own experience. Back in 1980, when China was just embarked on its reform and opening up program when President McNamara came to China to talk to our late leader Deng Xiaoping about China's seats in the IMF and the World Bank. You remember what kind of China it was in those days. China was ranked among the poorest in 1980 with $270 per capita. It is such a disgrace for a nation which boasts a civilization of 5,000 years. Born in 1940s, I have gone through those difficult years. The China in the 1960s and 1970s resembles a black and white picture which will never, ever fade from my memory. Membership in the World Bank ushered in an age of reconstruction and development. What came from the World Bank was not just the financial resources, but more crucially, new development concept, including efficient use of resources, training of human resources, upgrading of technology, and certainly infrastructure development. Massive investment in infrastructure with resources from the World Bank and later on from the ADB, and a bilateral assistance, and also international capital, all came to China to help with the development of modern infrastructure. Starting from the mid-1990s, Chinese economy took off. And now we have completely different economic landscape in China. In early 1980s, there was no expressway, no electrified railway, no power plants with generators over 300 megawatts, no high voltage transmission lines, no modern, modern airports or seaports, no nothing. In infrastructure, this infrastructure development has paved the path for Chinese economies taking off. And over the last three decades, China has managed to lift 600 million people out of poverty by China standard and 500 million people out of poverty by the World Bank standard 
we have 70 million people yet to be lifted out of poverty. But compared to the huge task of lifting 600 million people out of poverty, I think this is cakewalk. We can do it very easily. Now that China is more developed and thus can afford to provide financial resources to other developing countries in Asia, it is our turn to do something for the rest of the Asia and in, in certain sense for the rest of the world. When President Xi Jinping received 57 countries, lead, uh, finance ministers and state leaders in Beijing in the signing of the Arctic Agreement, he said, we in China have benefited from the general support from the World Bank, from ADB, and the bilateral support. The Chinese people will never ever forget about that. We are grateful. It's our turn to contribute. China's initiative was received with suspicion in the very beginning. Skeptics cast doubt on China's ability to create such a bank and to attract the supporters from Asian regions, particularly in the context of territorial disputes with some of the neighbors. Speculation ran rampant that China intended to create and run a bank that could undercut the World Bank and ADB and other multilateral institutions. By the reckless lending operations with total disregard of environment and human rights, we in China understood the background of such suspicion and skepticism. We have never overreacted to hurtful and negative comments on our initiative. We are very calm. We remain very serene. And you see, fierce oppositions and behind the screen uh, lobbying against China uh, could, be, could be handled by us. President Xi Jinping is very much determined to pursue this initiative. Even if we end up having only one country, only China, one man band running this institution, we will do it. And some of China's close friends chimed in, no, you won't be alone. At least there will be two. And I think you have no difficulty figuring out what is that country. We say, at least we will have two. We will be two. But of course, it's more than two. We have 57. When I was picked up by the Chinese leaders to head the China's working group for establishing the AIB, I was advised by a very close friend of mine, who's an American. He came to my office when I was chairman of the CICC. He said, Mr. Chin, you have enjoyed a very good reputation over the last 40 years. Don't do it. I don't want to see your reputation be destroyed by doing this. I told him, thank you very much. But I don't think my reputation will be destroyed. Indeed, it will be enhanced. I decided to take up the honorous job, understanding that the Chinese leaders intended to create a first-class multilateral development institution with a 21st century governance. I would, not have, I would not have taken this job without this conviction. It does not make any sense if China wants to have a bank, or run a bank, a la China, or the Chinese way. We have numerous financial institutions. Give you some reference. China's Development Bank and Exim Bank have a combined overseas assets in amount of 500 billion US dollars. More than the combined resources of all these MDBs. It's not the amount of assets we build up. It's actually the new approach we would like to, to try. And we think this is very much important. The, it, is expected, it, it is expected that there will be sufficient number of Asian countries to join the bank. The issue is whether the membership should be open to non-regional countries, particularly developed countries. There is a legitimate issue, legitimate issue, 
if only regionals are members, are allowed to be members. There's also a practical issue. If this is yet another international bureaucracy with excessive conditionality imposed by non-regional members, this is a practical issue. The Asian countries, particularly the Asian developing countries, are worried about the latter, and China is concerned over the former. China is more concerned over the legitimate issue, and the borrowing countries are more concerned over the excessive conditionality. The Chinese governmental institutions, the Ministry of Finance, Foreign Affairs, Central Bank, and others, are involved in conceptualizing this new bank over the architect of this new bank. The bank will be positioned as a multilateral financial institution. We all agree in China that membership will be open to any country which would accept the MOU under discussion at that time, and also certainly the Articles Agreement, which was later on to be prepared. And we all agree that governance should measure up to the highest possible standard. It is also envisaged that the bank should be developed, taking advantage of the experience of existing MDBs, but should not be their clones. The bank should have its distinctive new features with a combination of the merits of MDBs and those of the successful private sector companies. The process of negotiation on MOU and later on AOA has been a process of trust building among all of the prospective founding members and a test of China's commitment to cooperation with all the other prospective founding members for this purpose. When you see today the result of the efforts of all the prospective founding members, a new type development bank is taking shape, a new development bank with 21st century governance. The political and economic landscape is quickly changing in this world. Developing countries are trying to change the status quo and want to experiment with new development and poverty reduction approaches. The dominant members in the existing MDBs need to consider how to improve the representation by the developing countries in all those institutions and bring the existing institutions closer to the client countries. AIB is not a rival to the World Bank, ADB, or any other MDBs. The leadership dialogue between AIB and all these institutions has been going very smoothly, and we enjoy very, very good collegiality and a sense of cooperation. The working group level people are working very, very well. Hopefully, AIB will, will be also a boost to the reform process in those institutions keen on reform and management upgrading. Personally, I could not possibly have designed the gov governance and model sovereignty of this bank. In close collaboration with the MOF and experts from the World Bank, EBRD, ADB, and EIB, etc., without my six years of experience on board of the World Bank, five years in the management of ADB, five years in Chinese sovereign wealth funds, and two years in the Chinese private company. The audit agreement and policy papers represent the consensus of the prospective founding members on the governance and the modest priority of this new institution. The, this manifests the professionalism of the staff of the multilateral interim secretariat, who are mostly former senior professionals of the World Bank and other MDBs. I'm very proud to tell you we have benefited from the contributions of a number of US nationals. I'm very much grateful to their dedication and contribution. Let me quote the English poet Andrew Marvel, who comments on Milton's Paradise Lost. He said, thou hast not missed one thought that could fit, and all that was improper dost omit. Let me paraphrase. The basic documents of AIB do not miss any important elements, which are the integral components of the first class governance, and anything not suitable for a 
multilateral development bank has no place at all in our policy papers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed that, Mr. Jin. It was very personal and, uh, uh, you know, part of it I found actually quite moving. I'm going to start the conversation by asking you a few questions, but we'll quickly turn to the audience because there's so much interest. I'm going to start with the big question. You, you alluded to it a little bit, mm -hmm. but I want to go into it a little bit more. Uh, you know, the big question that you know, people are debating outside of China is, is AIB a challenge to the existing international order? And let me just be a little bit more specific. I think if you look at the Western commentary, you, know, you see two strands. Some is relatively positive. It sees AIB as something of a challenge, but in a positive way. You know, China taking a leadership role and trying to create more efficiency in the development banks, starting with AIB and potentially being spill over to World Bank, other institutions, ADB, et cetera. And then there's a more negative commentary, which sees this as the beginning of China creating an alternative set of international economic institutions. So I'd ask you to comment on that. And you know, what, what, what would be your response to people who worry that this is the beginning of uh, creating a new set of international institutions? Thank you. Thank you for the question. You know, the idea of having a multilateral development institution is actually uh, the very, I would say, fruit of the experience of the existing MDBs. The Bretton Woods institutions and later on the other MDBs actually, as I said, have contributed substantially to the economic development, social development, and certainly poverty reduction. But you should understand, Bretton Woods institutions were created seven decades ago. ADB is going to have the 50th anniversary, 2016. EBRD was created a quarter century ago. The question was raised repeatedly whether we need a new MDB all these years. But MDBs came up, supranationals came up. But still, there is something you need to do. They cannot cover all of the areas. That's why we believe in today's Asia, in spite of the huge amount of contribution and work by the World Bank ADB, we still need a new development institution. The Pacific and Indian Ocean is vast enough. The Eurasia land is vast enough for us to have one more little MDB. What's the worry? And some people said, this could be a huge problem with World Bank or ADB because they say this is going to be tough in a competition. Please don't underestimate the capability of the World Bank and ADB. This new bank is just a sibling. How can we defeat these huge giants at one fell swoop? It's nonsense. If I worked in the World Bank. I worked in ADB. I will be offended you make that kind of comments. These are great institutions, right? We learn from their experience. But we focus on infrastructure. We are very much focused. World Bank takes care of the poverty reduction, social programs, environment. Certainly we would contribute also, but we do it in a different approach. So you must allow developing countries some new ideas. You must allow developing countries to, to create a new institution. For the first time in this world, we have a development institution, a regional bank in Asia. Asian countries are the majority shareholders, 75% of the shares, 25% for non-Asians. Right, and developing countries are the majority owner, right? But this is very much important, you know, uh, David. Why, with only 25% of the shares for non-regionals, they are so keen on joining us? At least from their perspective, they do believe they have a role to play. They have a role to play in this institution. They believe the Europeans, some other countries believe, in spite of a quarter voting power, they can contribute. Because they believe China is not going to be a dominant member dictating the operations of this institution. So as I said on a number of occasions, this is a vote of confidence. 
in a China-led bank. We will live up to your expectations. We will not abuse this vote of confidence. Thank you. The, the, the last part of your response kind of leads naturally to my next question. You know, some commentators in the West are worried that AIB will be a narrow tool of Chinese foreign policy. And some of the commentary in China talks about AIB you know, being part of the larger One Belt, One Road initiative. So my question is, how do you see AIB relating to One Belt, One Road? And, and, and do you have some tension? You've got some big members like India, which has expressed some concerns about One Belt, One Road, but seems to be an enthusiastic member of AIB. So how, you know, how, how do you manage that tension? You know, it's understandable. At the very outset, there were skeptics. Uh, there were questions about the Chinese motivation. Because from day one, we said, in the beginning, China is committed to provide up to 50% of the resources of this institution. That was misinterpreted. Because the, we say, at the very beginning, when there were not sufficient members, we would like to provide up to 50% of the shares. When new members come in, our shares would go down. Okay. In spite of the clarification repeatedly, still, some people still talk about 50%, 50%, 50%. But you see, I said, you know, we are not worried. Because the, throughout the whole process of negotiation of MOU and uh, AOA, people understand we mean it when we say we want to work with all of the countries. China is not going to be the dominant member of this institution. And the negotiation process itself tells the whole world how we prepare for the establishment of this bank and how we would manage. As you know, the audit agreement stipulates that this bank will have universal procurement. This bank will have universal recruitment. So if we have this kind of governance, What's the worry? This bank is not created exclusively for one belt, one road. This bank is created and owned by now 57 countries to cover all of the developing countries in Asia. Of course, some countries in the one belt, one road area are members. We certainly should help them, but we will not neglect those countries which are not part of it. It's the bank owned by 57 countries. We have the governance. We have all these policy papers negotiated and agreed upon by all of the prospective founding members. You could be 100% sure this bank will be operated and managed by the highest possible standard. You also find some commentary in the Chinese press and on Chinese internet suggesting that AIB can help China with its overcapacity problem. I'm a little bit skeptical about this myself, but uh, <laughs> I'm just want, curious, how, how do you respond when, when, uh, if one of your member countries uh, confronts you? Because it's, you know, it's, it's frankly not really an adroit thing to say to your neighbors that, uh, that this can help deal with your overcapacity problem. With the size of China's economy, this overcapacity issue should certainly be absorbed by the Chinese economy itself, right? And I, I don't think it is right to say overcapacity categorically. Overcapacity in certain sectors, but not in all of the sectors. And the restructuring of the Chinese economy can deal with this issue. And uh, with regard to the so-called exporting overcapacity, please remember we have a universal procurement policy. And it's open to all of the companies on a competitive basis. I, you know, we have very uh, competitive companies from Korea, Japan, United States, and European countries. So it's fair. It's fair business. Okay. One more question for me, so get ready for your question. You enjoy okay. all the privileges. I'm, I would be, I would be protesting on behalf of the audience. No, I think we, we have plenty, one more, one more. plenty of time. We're all friends, but that doesn't stop me from asking tough questions. Um, you enjoy this privilege because you are the moderator. I've heard, I've heard you speak eloquently. I, you didn't use the phrase today, but I've heard you speak eloquently about wanting the bank to be lean, clean, clean and green. green. Right, yeah. so efficient, environmentally sensitive, fighting corruption. 
in practice, how, you know, I mean, that's the frustration many clients have with the World Bank, for example, that, you know, it's slow and bureaucratic, okay? So how do you make it lean? How do you make it more efficient while still meeting the environmental standards and the fiduciary standards? We depend this on the governance and the rigorous implementation of the governance. To stay lean certainly is not that easy, particularly as an, as an institution develops and evolves. It's like a human body. You have to go to the fit, fitness center every day to keep lean. So we have to go to fitness center as an institution, which means you must make sure there's no redundant position. If you allow one redundant position today, there will be two, there will be three, there will be four. And when these redundancies become the massive, become massive, it's very hard for you to, for you to cut it out. So we have to be conscious of keeping lean. Zero tolerance of corruption is the key for, for our institution to be successful, to be recognized as a first-class institution. I'm sure we can do it. David, you know about uh, World Bank selling into China. When I was director general of the World Bank Department, and we manage altogether uh, about $40 billion of you know, lending from World Bank ADB. Under my leadership, not a single staff was involved in corruption cases. None of them were put in prison, just because I implement the anti-corruption policy. It's the implementation. It's not a paper. It is policies on paper that matters. It's the way you deal with it in a very tough way. If you, as the head, is clean, nobody dares to do it. That's the key. So when I left Chinese Ministry of Finance to take over the position of vice president in ADB, my staff came to me Say, Mr. Jin, thank you very much. None of us has ever been in prison. <laughs> I, think, I told them, if this is what I expect to, to achieve, that's the minimum. And they told me later, just because we know you don't put a single dollar in your pocket, nobody else has the guts to do it. Let me tell you, my grandfather, my grandmother, my mother's mother is 108 years old still alive and a kicking. 35 years ago, when I came to the World Bank, she heard about it. Remember, mm. I worked on the Chinese land for 10 years, earning a month, how much dollars? 30, 30 RMB in those days. Just, just, you know, peanut. And my grandmother didn't ask me, my grandson, how much money you are going to make. Now you are managing the money of the whole world. <laughs> she didn't ask me about my pay. She just said, my grandson, from now on, you will have two pockets. One is the public pocket, the other is the pri po private pocket. Don't move a single dollar from the public pocket to your private pocket. I never, ever forget about that. Okay, a yeah, very nice response. Okay, we turn to the public. Uh, uh, start with this woman here, and do we have a microphone, presumably? Yep. Who's the first woman? This woman uh, here in the fourth row. And, and please uh, state your name, identify yourself briefly. Thank you very much. Thanks for your discussion. Jennifer Chen, reporter with Shenzhen Media Group. I would like to know, how do you evaluate the potential impact of the recent reached agreement of TPP to the current and uh, future master plan of the AIIB. Thank you very much. You know, uh, China is uh, interested in joining TPP. Uh, for some reason, China is still not a member. But I think uh, this issue will be resolved with or without China's membership in TPP. China's reform program and China's liberalization its policies would make it possible for China to have cross-border investment and trade with all of these members who are the TPP. So I don't think it's, it's a such a serious problem because we have free trade zones with a quite number of countries. And I do hope 
the bilateral uh, agreement with the United States would be worked out. It's very much important for the interest of the United States, for China. I do believe over my 35 years of experience working with the US uh, in the government or in the company uh, businesses, it's vitally important for US and China should be working together. Now, even though for some reason China could not be part of TPP, the door keeps open for US membership being AIIB. I told, I told the US government officials, the door keeps open. We have the standing invitation. Anytime you think you are ready, pick up a phone, give me a ring, and we will handle the best of the business. And some people asked me a very interesting question. Why do you still welcome the United States, even though the US reject you from TPP? The answer is very simple. We are inclusive. We are more generous. <laughs> well, now, sorry, I do have to defend the US slightly here, because certainly more recently, you've had our national security advisor, Susan Rice, you know, state very publicly that the US welcomes China to join TPP in a second round, you know, to be frank. So China's not one of the initial negotiators. But uh, that is the US position. You know, I, I think your, your openness is admirable, and it would be very positive if down the road the U.S. joins AIB, China's in TPP, other big countries like India. You're, you know, you've got big members that are, not, that are not yet talking about joining TPP. But you can imagine you know, a much more integrated economy with good infrastructure and also with, with uh, more open borders. Very good. I look forward to closer cooperation between the United States and China. I, I think our two, uh, two nations, our two great peoples can work wonders if we stay closely working together. And I never doubt about this. Good, okay, other questions? Uh, Philippe over there, uh, microphone please. Thank you, I'm Philippe Leco. I'm a visiting fellow in the foreign policy program here. Mr. Jean, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting speech. I have a question. You, you mentioned EBRD, the European Bank of uh, Reconstruction and Development, that was set up 25 years ago uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I would, I would be interested in a sort of comparison with why uh, AIB is uh, coming to life now. I mean, obviously, it has nothing to do with politics. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you could sort of uh, uh, go further in, in your description of, of the, uh, uh, you know, the, what the bank wants to do and uh, how does it compare with the ADB 25 years ago? Thank you. EBRD is the only multilateral development institution with a very clear political agenda. All the other institutions are apolitical institutions, and they process financing uh, of any loans or projects on the basis of economic considerations. And I would say EBRD did a wonderful job. It was very successful in helping the Eastern European countries, the uh, Republic's former Soviet Union. But later on, uh, the governments of EBRD thought the mission completed. They should shut down this institution. You, you may have heard about that. But how can you kill an institution which has been doing very well? So finally, they fine-tune the mandate of EBRD. So EBRD is actually working in countries which were not considered part of the recipient countries at the very outset. And we, I have had a very good discussion with, uh, with Suma, uh, and uh, EBRD is very much keen in working with us. So EBRD fine-tunes its mandate and also its approaches. That's why we believe uh, we should uh, not be too restricted in designing uh, the governance and uh, in designing the mandate of this institution. We say AIB would be promoting economic and social development through infrastructure investment. And uh, the infrastructure is defined very broadly. Could be energy, uh, power, power generation, distribution, transmission. Uh, could be transport, roads or freeways, railways, seaports, airports, logistics, water supply, urban development, rural electrification. 
and, and all these kind of things, and other productive sectors. So when we discuss these, some people ask me, Mr. Chen, what do you mean by other productive sectors? I said, other productive sectors means other productive sectors. <laughs> so we should be very liberal. And uh, early in the days, we focused on physical infrastructure. But as we move forward, why not doing something which is non-physical, such as health, which could be a very important area. And uh, we do not pick out environmental protection specifically as an area for investment. But, but this is uh, covered by our you know, uh, policy papers. The financing of the infrastructure must be conducive to environmental protection. We do not want to leave a footprint in the environment. We want to be promoting green economy. And uh, uh, let's see, we can learn we can be doing learning by doing, and I think we can improve. But I will highlight the point. We have drawn lots of experience from the operations of the World Bank, ADB, and other institutions. This is the advantage of the newcomer. And we are working very closely together. You know, we want to have the best of the cooperation in this world. Hmm. Uh, I think I should get someone toward the back. Um, there's a woman with her hand up back in the left corner there. Yep. Hi, thank you. Jane with China China News. Um, uh, Dr. King, uh, we believe that uh, the UK and the US has very different approach to our AIIB. And you are at the front line. When negotiating with the UK and the US officials, how do you find the difference? Thank you. Uh, I see a lot of similarities rather than differences. Uh, both countries are advanced countries. Both countries regard a high standard of governance, international best practice. Both countries are very keen on helping the low developing countries in Asia. Both countries are major shareholders of Bretton Woods institutions and also ADB. So there are a lot of similarities. There's only a little bit difference UK uh, was the first European countries which decided to join. The United States, uh, for some reason, uh, had more issues to handle. So we understand. For such a big country, you have lots of issues on your hand. We could be very patient. Take your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, this gentleman right here toward the front. Uh, sorry, I meant... Come forward, please, yeah. There we go. Um, thank you. I'm Chen Wei from on behalf of Medtronic. We are the largest medical device company in the world. And my question, and thank you for your speech, uh, speak today. Uh, my question is about the other productive sector you mentioned earlier. And thanks for it's the first time you mentioned the healthcare uh, in the official statement. And um, my question is where you answer my first question first is, will AIB include healthcare infrastructure in your future plan? The answer is yes. But faster, how AIB will prioritize the healthcare infrastructure? There's no doubt that healthcare, healthcare is highly relevant to the development of the country. And from smaller to the equipment in the, in the emergency room, to the building of hospital, to the, the reform of the uh, health insurance system, the new approach in the healthcare, we call it the healthcare infrastructure. So I want to uh, understand your thoughts on this issue. Thank you. You see, we would have the operational policies approved by the future board. It's now being debated and deliberated by the chief negotiators. Uh, I think it's easier for us to reach agreement when we have the board, maybe a couple of years down the road, to do something like healthcare, because this is very much important. I noticed uh, the trend in Asia. In spite of the fact Asian countries are pretty young, but the aged population is also on the rise. It's simply masked by the large number of young population. Don't underestimate the impact of the aging population. This is something we should keep in mind. Don't wait until the entire you know, population is aging. Even in India, I, I saw some of the uh, 
analysis. Even in India, probably the fertility rate would be coming down. Chinese fertility rate is down very much, you know, fast. So we have to be careful about that. So I will leave this to the future board to discuss what we will do. But for the time being, at least for the first decade or so, we should focus on physical infrastructure. And then we will think about expanding uh, into other areas. Anyway, other productive sectors leave us room for maneuver, right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, right here. Thank you, Vice Minister. Welcome to Brookings. Uh, so uh, given the scale of the demand that we see in infrastructure and also, you know, the changes that have taken place, including in China, uh, one is looking for a much larger role for the private sector uh, in infrastructure now. But at the same time, the role of the government remains central in directing infrastructure. How do you see, in some sense, uh, your role in catalyzing, you know, new private sector investment? That's a very important uh, question. Uh, World Bank has IFC, which has been uh, working with the private sector. ADB has the private sector operations department. We don't have separate uh, units focusing on private sector. Uh, we have a different approach. Uh, we can process any project, but whether it's private sector, uh, operation or sovereign guaranteed project, we can we can have uh, make a decision at the end of the day, right? So I think uh, uh, our efforts to promote private sector development would be very important part of our strategy. Uh, there are two things you need to think about. First of all, the level of institutional capability, which is the defining factor for any country in a particular historical stage. So you cannot skip it, right? So in a number of countries in Asia, probably you have to work with the uh, governmental institutions and the uh, uh, public sector to do some things which could be reasonably sure for us that this could be a good project. Meanwhile, I think we can develop the capability of the private sector. So. I believe by working with the public sector and also at the same time to promote the institutional capability of the private sector, you, you can achieve both. Uh, you cannot wait until the private sector to be fully capable of doing large uh, infrastructure projects. It's impossible. Uh, so it's a process. Uh, early in the uh, years, we would do more in the uh, public sector sovereign guarantee projects. This is important for us to have assurance we will have a financial foundation built up. And this is also comfortable from the perspective of the rating companies. But I do believe as we move forward, we should do more in terms of the private sector operations. As, as a follow-up, can I ask, in your ADB experience, were there any good examples of uh, public-private partnership? Because ADB does have that flexibility. ADB certainly has been trying to do this. And when, when I was in ADB, uh, my portfolio uh, was 65% of the ADB's total lending program. And uh, the private sector portion was not very big because of the concern over the safety of the resources. Paradoxically, the private sector operations contributed more to ADB's balance sheets. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so again, well, I'll go back, I'll go to the back of the room, the gentleman against the wall. Thank you very much. Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency. Dr. Kim, thank you for a wonderful uh, speech here. And um, my question for you is, uh, it was reported by the Financial Times that uh, after President Xi Jinping's visit to the US, uh, the both sides has, have reached the consensus that uh, 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 China will support the uh, uh, existing uh, financial system, international system, and the U.S. Uh, will uh, no longer boycott the AIIB. Uh, would you please confirm that? Uh, the secondary, uh, what's your purpose of this visit to the U.S.? Uh, is it possible 
uh, in the future that the AIIB will support some infrastructure building in the US, such as the high speed rail <laughs> building. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I am ordinary citizen of the People's Republic of China. It's not appropriate for me to confirm what our leader confirmed. <laughs> we are very happy that President Obama is very, very positive about AIIB. Certainly, uh, given the domestic you know, uh, uh, procedures or, or some other kind of things, you know, it will take some time. Uh, but uh, uh, this positive stance towards AIB is very much appreciated. Uh, President Xi Jinping uh, announced or reiterated on a number of occasions that China would uh, uh, be supporting the World Bank, ADB, and other institutions by contributing to either ADF and uh, through other bilateral assistance. Because China is a major shareholder of the Bretton Woods institutions. China is a major shareholder of ADB. We have to behave as a responsible member of these institutions and of the international community. So setting up a new bank does not mean we would dilute our support for the existing institutions. We are proud to say that China is probably the few countries in this world which could be quickly graduating from uh, IDA and be a contributor. So we will continue to that. And as I said in my opening statement, President Xi Jinping said, we are grateful to the World Bank, to ADB, to the bilateral assistance. The Chinese people will never, ever forget about that. Now, by this we mean we simply just tell you, we won't forget about it. We will do something concrete. We'll be supporting. And uh, this is not actually in conflict with having a new bank. Because this is not China's bank. This is bank owned by, by so many countries. So uh, uh, I think uh, now a lot of people are so relaxed about this. No, no, no worries. Yeah. But, and why, yeah. why are you here in the US on this visit? <laughs> that, that was part of his question. Do you question my right to be visited in this country? <laughs> oh, uh, certainly. Uh, let me tell you, I, I have lots of you know, invitations from the uh, U.S. governmental institutions, financial institutions, business companies, and also IMF and the World Bank. And, and Brookings, I thought you were here in order to speak at Brookings. <laughs> I, uh, I was uh, here uh, a couple of years ago. I think that it was 20... Uh, 2009, when I, I spoke to a larger audience, then people asked me a question, Mr. Chin, do you think China wants to build a railway in the United States? Uh, you want to send you know, people working here? I said, we Chinese helped build railways in the United States 100 years ago. <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> so now if we want to contribute, we may contribute financial resources, maybe some technical, you know, uh, expertise. Uh, you, you do. I said you do have technology. Americans can build their rapid way without any help from any country. But perhaps we could be more cost effective. And we are not going to send huge number of Chinese workers to do it. Don't worry. We are not going to take out, away your jobs, okay? But I do believe when you upgrade your in infrastructure in this country. That will create huge jobs for the American people, right? Yep. Thank you. Um, there's a gentleman standing right next to the woman. Yeah, the gentleman right next to your right. Okay. John Zan with CTI TV of Taiwan. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Jing, for a uh, very uh, candid and delightful discussion. Your uh, uh, enthusiasm in keeping the door open uh, for the U.S. to join is impressive, but would you extend the same welcome to Taiwan? And we all know Taiwan wants very much to join the AIB. Thank you very much. Thank you. Whether Taiwan would be a member or not, this is our internal family business. 
we will work this out. And if you read the article's remit, you see, I, I, would, uh, I would tell you, Natalie, uh, my chief counsel, is the architect of the article's remit. Uh, she has experience with the World Bank uh, for many years. Natalie is such a smart, you know, uh, an intelligent uh, chief counsel. She will not leave out anything which will, be, which will be very much important. We say AIIB's membership is open to the World Bank and to ADB. That speaks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, this woman here. Hi. Um, so my name is Yubi. I'm from the Center for American Progress. And um, I was wondering that um, in the draft, um, you know, the initial draft of environmental and social standards, so there's a, a really relaxed room for investing in projects that may have, like, negative environmental impacts, like new uh, coal power plants. So on one hand, like, people raise concerns when they compare to the standards to, like, uh, other organizations like the World Bank that, like, really re restricts funding new coal plants. But on the other hand, like many countries are in favor of AIIB's, you know, relatively lower standards. So given that the China itself is like really committed to reducing emission and shutting, have been like shutting down coal plants, I was wondering uh, what's AIIB's coal policy and will we see like more tightening uh, standards, uh, environmental standards in the final draft? Thank you. You know, the... Uh Major policy uh, papers are almost uh, in the final uh, shape, and we will be going to Jakarta, Indonesia, early November to uh, to agree or uh, to endorse the all these policy papers. Um, you raised an issue with regard to the pros and the cons of financing coal burning power plants. This is a very, very, I think, uh, I would say, uh, sensitive issue and also very difficult to handle. Uh, in general uh, principle, we are committed to promote green economy, to reduce global warming um, emissions, and that is something we would uh, uphold very rigorously. But how can we achieve this? <coughs> I think, on the one hand, we should minimize or to rule out any major infrastructure projects which could leave a big footprint in the environment. On the other hand, you have a large number of poor people in Asia who need power. And uh, how do you balance this? I cannot tell you what is our ultimate policy. Because I'm not a dictator. We will discuss this by the future board. Whether we would be financing coal burning projects or rule it out altogether. I cannot give you an answer. EBRD selectively finances coal firing power plants. Selectively. For instance, if a poor country is sitting on a huge amount of coal deposits, no gas, no foreign exchange. So are you asking this poor country to import very expensive gas and forbid them to build coal-firing power plants? Or you would watch these people to remain in poverty or in the dark? That's not simply an environmental problem is also a human rights problem. So what, what, what do you want to do? It is a very difficult issue. And if you say no, we say no to coal-firing power plants, the country will have no alternative but to build their own coal-firing power plants. This would be the reality. Probably you have to accept, like it or not. I remember the World Bank helped us with the supercritical power plants, 900 megawatt power plants in Shanghai. Supercritical. And I think sequestration of carbon dioxide and silver dioxide is wonderful. So can we do something helping them knock out all those low efficient polluting power plants, coal power, 
and do something super critical. So in the final analysis, you still achieve reduction of the, of the uh, emissions, right? So there are very difficult issues and trade-offs. I cannot give you the answer whether we will do it or not. We will have a thorough discussion, debate on our board in the future before we can come to any conclusions. Thank you. That was excellent. I think we have time for one more question. Um, this woman here with the glasses. Thank you, Zhao Yingfeng, reporter from Initium Media Hong Kong. Thank you both for the discussion. Uh, my question is, in your opinion, what will be a fair credit rating for AIIB? And if it doesn't get the highest level of credit rating, you mentioned that uh, AIIB, AIIB will rely on the Chinese investors. Would the banks still stay competitive in that weight? And the second question is, where and when will the first project of AIIB take place? And which are the countries that AIIB will give priority to? Thank you. We are fair to all of the borrowing countries in Asia. Whether a particular country would be part of the first batch of countries, of the recipients, it depends on the availability, bankability of the projects. I cannot uh, say at this moment, we are having the professionals uh, for prof professional teams, they will be preparing the projects. So we won't have the first project. We would have the first batch of projects. In this batch, there will be standalone projects prepared by our own experts. We would have co-financing with the World Bank, with ADB, maybe EBRD. So the first batch of projects, which might be launched uh, the second quarter of next year. So uh, this is uh, what we are planning to do with regard to rating. Um, you see, I think we enjoy quite a number of advantages, uh, which could be very much important for the assignment of uh, a AAA rating. First of all, this is the bank with the highest ratio of paid in, 20% paid in capital, the highest. Secondly, uh, we have a governance. The governance is really the best. I'm very proud of it. If you compare governance structure with other existing institutions, where we have, we would have uh, talents of highest caliber from across the world. We do not reject any nationals, even if their countries are not members. We don't reject the professionals for highest caliber just because of their passports. We don't reject any companies to help develop the infrastructure just because their countries are not members. So we will have the first class top tier management and all of the staff down to the high, uh, rank and file. This is the fundamental guarantee for the success of such kind of institution. <coughs> so we enjoy a lot of advantages. We do not have the track record of AIB as an institution, but we enjoy the track record of individual managers. So if you have a high quality team, there shouldn't be any problem with the performance of AIB as we move forward. So I think rating companies will take all these factors into serious consideration. I certainly would hope they would treat me fairly. However, if the worst comes to the worst, we have huge Chinese market to tap. And I'm happy to tell you, quite a number of countries, member countries, would support AIB. So I'm not worried. And I certainly believe the rating companies would do a good job. Thank you. Well, Mr. Jin, you've been extremely generous with your time. And I think to, just to frankly answer these various questions is extremely helpful. We really appreciate you joining us. So let's give Mr. Jin a good round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.